Welcome back, boils and ghouls. Don't worry, you're not lost. You're just off the beaten rack. This video was supposed to come out on Dr. Seuss's birthday, but apparently either my daughter's school had the date wrong or they didn't feel like reading the Lorax in the middle of the week. And I'm late on my deadlines as always anyway. So tonight I thought we would take a closer look at Theodore Seuss Geisel, better known as Dr. Seuss. I know he's not exactly a Superman artist and he never wrote on X-Men, but I think most people would admit that Dr. Seuss played an integral role in their childhoods. As adults, it's much easier to see the moral lessons often having to do with heavy topics like environmentalism and racism that Geisel was driving home at the core of his many immensely popular children's books like The Lorax and The Story of the Sneetches. As kids though, they just seem like stories. But how exactly did Theodore Seuss Geisel so seamlessly interweave his personal moral and political agendas with the fantastical worlds he created without becoming transparent or worse yet, preachy or boring? The answers lie in Geisel's little discussed formative years, a time before the cat in the hat and worldwide notoriety. For what would have been Geisel's 116th birthday, I wanted to share a collection of books from my personal collection that showcase his overlooked, underappreciated, and in many cases completely unknown political cartoons. I know this video is technically about Dr. Seuss, but there's a reason I'm going to be referring to him as Theodore Seuss Geisel throughout. This isn't the Dr. Seuss from One Fish, Two Fish, or Green Eggs and Ham. Here, Horton's more likely to hear a hand grenade than a who. Geisel was intensely invested in getting America involved in World War II, and as such, I want to add most of these images were produced during the wartime and leading up to the wartime efforts, and often for the means of propaganda of sorts. They feature utterly distasteful racial stereotypes and some mildly disturbing imagery. Don't worry, there's no nudity or cursing, however, there might be a lot of swastikas. And I just don't want kids thinking this is a video about the author of How the Grinch Stole Christmas because Theodore Seuss Geisel and Dr. Seuss are different people in my mind and tonight I'd like to show you why. So without further ado, let's explore Theodore Seuss Geisel, political cartoonist extraordinaire. Born in 1904, Geisel was always interested in writing and humor. While attending college, he was actually caught drinking during the years of prohibition, and as a result, he was forced by faculty to resign from any and all extracurricular activities, including working as the editor-in-chief for the school comedy magazine, The Dartmouth Jack-O-Lantern. Instead of actually leaving the magazine, however, Geisel made a fateful decision to take on a nom de plume, which would become his alter ego in life, Seuss. Working under the name Seuss, Geisel continued to work for the Jack-O-Lantern until eventually graduating and heading from Dartmouth to Oxford. While at Oxford studying to be an English teacher, Geisel met a woman, Helen Palmer, who would change the course of his life dramatically. Instead of encouraging Geisel to complete his schooling as an English teacher, Helen Palmer urged Geisel to follow his fanciful dreams of being an artist, apparently quite taken by the amazing creatures he would fill his notebooks with. After much encouragement, Geisel left Oxford without graduating to pursue a career in the arts in 1927 under the advice of Helen Palmer. I don't hear people talk about Helen a lot, but she comes up in every single book that I have where Geisel writes about himself or his work. If it were not for Helen Palmer, the world would likely have never known Dr. Seuss. Striking out from Oxford early in 1927, it took less than six months for Geisel to sell his first illustration. From there, he quickly found employment working for a few magazines on an ongoing basis, most notably PM and Judge, where most of the cartoons and illustrations that we're looking at came from. These early magazines would be an invaluable learning tool for Geisel, who quickly excelled at his work and began to expand into other more lucrative venues of the illustration field, and they provided Geisel with enough of a steady income he felt comfortable enough to marry Helen Palmer that same year. In 1928, Geisel landed a gig doing an ad campaign for Standard Oil and fell into the advertising game overnight. He did campaigns for the likes of Life, Vanity Fair, 
Ford and NBC, Theodore Geisel was soon making more money than any of his Dartmouth or Oxford classmates who'd bothered to graduate. Taking advantage of his newfound fortune, during the next several years, Geisel began traveling the world extensively with his wife, and in 1936, he wrote his first children's book, To Think I Heard It, on Mulberry Street while on a boat during one of their trips. Although it would eventually reach an audience, To Think I Heard It on Mulberry Street apparently took a dishearteningly long time for Geisel to get published. According to varying quotes, the book was turned down between 25 and 40 times by different publishers. In fact, the book may never have even been published had Geisel not run into an old Dartmouth classmate who was working for Vanguard Publishing who helped Geisel get the book released. Despite this initial difficulty, Geisel would go on to publish four more books between 1936 and the outbreak of World War II in 1939, most notably Horton Hatches an Egg. To say that Geisel was passionate about the war effort would be an understatement. If you can't tell by the name, Theodor Seuss Geisel was a German immigrant and as such faced a great deal of prejudice because of his heritage during the time leading up to World War II. Despite this prejudice, between 1939 and 1943, Theodor Geisel produced educational pamphlets, short films, and a host of other projects for the U.S. Armed Forces before eventually joining the Army as a captain and head of the animation department in 1941. During his stint as head of animation, he produced a number of animated shorts for the armed forces, most notably the Private Snafu shorts, as well as the original short version of a documentary about the Japanese occupation that would later be completed as a feature-length piece and go on to earn an Academy Award. Geisel took everything he did seriously as well as full advantage of the learning opportunities that his job presented him with. This is how Geisel would so easily adapt his work for animation years later while most children's authors would balk at the prospect. Before his work for the U.S. Armed Forces, however, Geisel produced more than 400 political cartoons in the two short years prior to the U.S. entering the war and Geisel joining the army. Thought lost to time for many years, in 1999, the new press released this Dr. Seuss Goes to War book. Weighing in at over 250 pages, it collects most of Geisel's wartime work, and thankfully, the little bit that was either missing or omitted was almost all collected in the Checker Books Early Years volumes, miraculously without a ton of overlap. As I said, Geisel learned from every job that he ever did. He evolved with every stroke of his brush. That being said, the precision of working in a single panel strip really puts a writer to the test. Telling a story in a single image, making it something that both grabs someone's attention and imparts a coherent idea with a minimum of text and space is going to push you to the limits. Now imagine doing that over 400 times in less than 800 days. Now imagine doing that while you're working on ad campaigns and you're making pamphlets about malaria and you're illustrating magazine articles. World War II was like a master class for Theodor Geisel in a lot of ways. By examining his political cartoons, you can literally watch him grow as an artist from strip to strip. As I pointed out in the introduction, there are some pretty tough racial stereotypes in this book due to the subject matter, and it's not something I pick up every day. What I find really interesting about this work, though, is how many levels it can be appreciated on. Historically, as part of the evolution of Geisel's art, as artifacts of the American psyche, they are invaluable time capsules in a lot of ways, and I'm really stoked someone bothered to transfer and collect them for posterity. Now, this isn't a review, but I guess I should point out, I've heard a lot of complaints about the art transfers, especially for the Checker Books collections. I'll agree, Checker never really does a very good job with their material. They get all this amazing stuff, and then they just totally botch the final release. Like, it's kind of sad. Thankfully, the art, it really doesn't suffer that much in this case, since most of it was produced for publication in black and white newsprint. But the formatting of the text, it does. And in some cases, that messes with the composition, which kind of defeats the purpose of archiving it in the first place. But hey, I'm just happy to have it at all, honestly. Formatting for the Checker books aside, they really do a great job of collecting the odds and ends of his early work for the magazine illustrations and ad campaigns. That being said, the vastly superior Dr. Seuss Goes to War presents the material slightly better. 
it's cheaper and really for 18 bucks you can't go wrong i think it does feature slightly better uh transfers of the art as well while this art might not be the dr seuss you remember it's the evolution of the author you'd come to know and love and while obviously best known for his work on children's books and animation, Theodore Geisel was a man of many hats. So I hope you enjoyed this little trip into some of the lesser discussed parts of his life and work. If you want to check out these books, there will be links in the description below. Now, I would normally urge you to hit up your local comic shop, but a lot of shops can't get mass market trades anymore. And I know you can pick these up dirt cheap on Amazon, so I'll make sure there are links in the description below. Thanks as always for sticking with me. I hope you enjoyed. If not, tune in tomorrow. Totally different video about a totally different book. If you did, do me a favor and hit that like button. If you really like what you saw, Hulk smash that subscribe button. If you do that, make sure you dang the notification bell to keep up with all these crazy videos I'm dropping all the time. If you really liked what you saw or you have questions about anything in tonight's video, please think about getting in the comments section below. Not only does it really help me out, but I love interacting with you all. If you have something you'd like to see an episode about as well, please get in the comments section below. Let me know. I'll do my best to get something together for you. Thanks again for sticking with me. I hope you enjoyed. And as always, I really, truly, and honestly ask only two things. Keep hitting those local shops. Keep reading comics.